Well, thank, thank you, everybody. It's a really pleasure to be here. Uh, good day, I guess, is the best way to uh, say hello to everyone. I'm sitting on the eastern coast of the United States, so it's a little bit later in the day uh, for me, although I'm sure it's different times for everybody that's on the call. So um, really excited to talk to everybody today about Microsoft Fabric and Microsoft Dynamics and uh, simply how they're better together uh, as, as you go forward and work towards Microsoft Dynamics as part of your Fabric architecture. And so just a little bit about me. Um, in my uh, day job, I'm a solution specialist at a company called Velocio. They're a partner here uh, in the United States that focuses quite a bit on Dynamics ERP. And matter of fact, has been doing so for 31 years. And so they have a variety of different customers, uh, about 4,000 um, that we interact with around both their ERP and CRM application needs. Uh, the group that I'm a part of and the role that I play as I interact with hundreds of those customers every year, just helping them understand, you know, kind of the path forward, the journey they can take with their data. Additionally, uh, I've had the good fortune of uh, doing a lot of stuff in my career. And so as a result, I, I periodically produce content uh, through uh, another organization, which is my own called NoNo Labs. Um, I've been a data and analytics practitioner for the last uh, 30 years. Uh, for those that are familiar with what the Professional Association for SQL Server was, I was one of the earliest board members for that organization for a number of years. I had a good fortune of working alongside of Brian Knight and others uh, as they brought the SQL Saturday vision to life. Many of you probably had a SQL Saturday at some point uh, available to you somewhere around the globe. Um, really excited for you know this opportunity to get out in front of the community. Can't thank the Fabric Global Online Conference organizers enough uh, for the opportunity to be here. Um, over the course of my journey, I took a little bit of a hiatus uh, from the community, uh, doing more executive-like things. I'm super glad to be back because I like to talk about technology. I love to talk about data. Um, and when I'm not doing those things, uh, I live in St. Augustine, Florida, again in the United States, and I like to restore classic Porsche motor cars uh, and boats for fun. So in terms of today's agenda, um, talk a little bit about the big picture and the challenges that honestly I've had a number of customers articulate to me uh, in my role. We'll talk a little bit about kind of reference elements from an architecture standpoint. Uh, we'll certainly talk about, uh, you know, kind of the, the role of uh, connecting to and accessing data in the really three primary D365 applications being business central, finance and operations, and uh, customer experience. Um, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, kind of how that all shakes out as it relates to the dataverse and uh, some of the features of one leg. And we'll close out with, you know, some information around why medallion architecture matters. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, how we leverage data from dynamics and the challenges uh, that, that people face. And so what I did is I went to, uh, trusty co-pilot and said, hey, let's let's generate a few pictures here. Uh, pictures that go along with the sentiments that, that I've heard from a number of customers. And one of the things that you'll find out as we go through this, uh, the slides today, is much like going on vacation, I've got a little bit too many slides in the suitcase. So we're gonna move kind of quickly, you know, through this stuff. But uh, um, if it's appropriate, I'm not exactly sure how the, how the Q&A functions are working, but please do put in questions uh, into the chat as we go. Um, and, you know, we'll try and get to those as much as we can. But talking about the challenges, um, many of the times that we encounter our Dynamics customers, you know, they're moving from some form of a legacy ERP into Dynamics 365 or possibly legacy CRM or another CRM application, you know, into that same environment. Many times there's a lot of tools that are in play, but they're not necessarily getting to a lot of answers. And you guys are all, you know, data and analytics practitioners, I'm sure. And so you have a, a good sense of, you know, kind of how there's just been a sprawl of technology to address the various questions that people have wanted to ask in kind of a departmental context, which has led to data dumps and Excel magic. And, you know, there's probably a lot of other ways to describe it. The other challenge that we've really seen quite a bit is that organizations have really struggled to relate things like their core ERP data, like D365 Business Central or D365 Finance and Operations with 
the rest of the business with other applications in the business. And, and so part of that reason for the struggle is because they've traditionally only answered questions directly out of those applications versus looking a bit broader, more broadly into what Fabric offers. And so again, we'll be talking about that. Um, and then in the, you know, kind of the third scenario is, um, and I'm sure many of you can relate or you've inherited, you know, kind of the uh, the mother of all workbooks that, that, you know, somehow does data extraction from two, three, four different places, multitude of tables, lots of queries, other things that feeds, you know, um, some perversion of VLOOKUPs and other things within Excel to try and create answers. You know, that is another thing that is a real common scenario that we're seeing, you know, with, with our customers, particularly as it relates to the technology side. In other cases, it, it's just other underlying factors, you know, so, um, some of you very well may be, you know, kind of that person in the middle, um, you know, in terms of being that singular person that can deliver answers to the organization, maybe through modern tooling like Power BI or maybe through legacy tooling like Excel or even things like Microsoft Access, which we still are coming across. Um, that dependence on one person obviously creates, you know, a lot of stress, you know, for the organization and rarely does it result in kind of an evolving architecture by its own because they're just not typically investing in, you know, trying to expand their architecture. Um, and then that, again, is where Fabric comes in. We'll talk about that as we go today. Um, the other is, you know, simply trying to bridge uh, the legacy data and the new ERP data. So any of you that have implemented, um, you know, D365 Business Central or D365 Finance and Operations have probably come from a different platform or maybe a preceding platform like uh, Navision or NAV or um, Dynamics AX as, as examples, or you may have come from an entirely different ERP. What the organization typically doesn't do well, in, based on our experience, is have you know the opportunity to look somewhat longitudinally at the business and says, "Great, we've been live on D three sixty five for two years, and we've got some great insights, you know, that we can get solely out of D three sixty five." But gosh, I wish we could look back, you know, three years, five years, whatever the case might be. And, and that, again, is where Fabric can kind of start to unify things, as, as one would expect, you know, based on the session title. Uh, and, and then certainly the kind of one of the other areas that's another factor is um, organizations oftentimes if they've been working solely within the Dynamics ecosystem, um, they haven't always had the great opportunity to augment the data. Maybe they've done some Power BI, you know, kind of um, additional shenanigans around the semantic model to try and bring in multiple data sources and those sort of things. And, and that works to an extent, but obviously it, it can kind of fall, fail under its own weight. And when we talk about augmenting the data, we're really talking about organizations that need, you know, kind of totally disparate you know, information sets, you know, so they may have an ERP, they may be in the service industry, weather may have an influence on their business. We happen to have a lot of agricultural customers and cannabis customers. Weather is a very, you know, prominent element in terms of, you know, kind of that additional data that they want to take in that they typically aren't taking in, you know, through their ERP. So there's a lot of those, you know, kind of things and challenges, of course. But, you know, the good news is, and particularly for those that maybe have just joined a little bit late, that all of the challenges that are out there for the Dynamics customers, such as yourselves, uh, gets a lot better with Microsoft Fabric. And there, there's a whole lot of reasons why, and I think that probably this group, more than, more than any other that I've spoken to, is probably pretty familiar with Microsoft Fabric as, you know, as its definition and the corresponding components that make up Microsoft Fabric. Uh, but just to cover all of our bases, one lake is the underpinning from a data storage perspective. That is basically the evolution of the data lake within the uh, fabric environment, obviously builds on what Azure Data Lake Storage and ADLS Gen 2 was. Um, and then of course you have, you know, both the combination of applications like Data Factory, Power BI, and Data Activator as real, you know, kind of defined products, along with, you know, various workloads around data engineering, data warehousing, data science, and of course, real-time analytics. And so all of those being available to us within Fabric just makes the, the opportunity to do more with Microsoft Dynamics data that much more exciting because we can really build, you know, quite a bit. And so in terms of our discussion today, um, 
and this is you know kind of the 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 skinniest uh, you know thank you so much and apologies if uh, if I broke up on anybody but um so this diagram that you see on the screen on the left hand side is just the general data sources that you know one can expect now if you've come from legacy microsoft dynamics uh you know in the united states that would be sl that would be gp you know potentially nav potentially ax um, probably similar applications, especially NAV, NAX elsewhere globally. Um, those are, you know, kind of the core kind of legacy Dynamics apps that are at the top left. And then, of course, there's the D365 applications, such as Finance and Operations, uh, Business Central representing the ERP, and then the customer experience side, uh, you know, being, you know, customer service, sales, and marketing, you know, is kind of the prominent elements. Real simplistically, there's a single arrow pointing at one leg, and we'll obviously build on that as we go. Um, and then out the other side is, you know, our most common pattern is we're seeing multiples of semantic models to address different subject areas being made available to the business so that they can do things within Power BI and the related technologies like paginated reports and analyze in Excel. Um, the other thing that, that is kind of interesting, particularly for the customers that are coming from those legacy uh, Dynamics applications, is Fabric kind of reintroduces the ability to author SQL directly against that Dynamics data again. Um, so organizations that have had you know, kind of a SQL intense, you know, kind of experience with their ERP um, that don't want to completely lose that. Going to Fabric, getting the data replicating from your ERP or from, you know, the CE environment um, gives you back those SQL endpoints that you can interact with. And we'll talk about that as we go. And so in, in this particular view, and this is, you know, all credit to James Sarah, you know, he, he produced this kind of reference architecture diagram. I really love it. It obviously, you know, adds, you know, kind of quite a bit of detail, uh, you know, underneath what's going on. Not, not here to really kind of walk through or explain it, you know, fully other than to say, this is a really good kind of way to double click or drill down on that prior diagram that I had, because it does talk to you about specifics of, you know, what happens within the data lake, what happens within the medallion architecture, you know, things of that nature, which, you know, we're, we're going to kind of scratch the surface on that today. So in terms of Dynamics 365 Business Central, there are a number of ways that, you know, organizations can access the Business Central data. Many of you have probably tried some of these. Um, Power BI has a business central connector that you can use. Um, Dataflow Gen 2 within Fabric uh, has the ability to connect directly to business central. As a matter of fact, you can use, you know, pipelines within Data Factory and certainly Spark Notebooks to go up against the, um, the API or the OData interfaces. And that is even supported on Dataflow Gen 1. Now, the, the punishing secret, you know, that maybe people don't know is all of these mechanisms will at some point start to kind of str struggle under their own weight, uh, particularly as you go through the, the API type interfaces into Business Central. Why is that? Because in a lot of cases, people are requesting kind of full extracts of the data re repeatedly. Um, and it's not really what the, the APIs themselves were designed for. And so, you know, your logical question, uh, you know, might be, well, is there a better means or is there a different means? And one of the ways that we've really standardized on in my organization um, is using what was originally produced by a couple of folks at Microsoft, Suma and Henri, um, and then later kind of evolved by uh, Bert Verbeek, who is one of the MVPs. He's based out of the Netherlands. Um, and it's basically available as a GitHub repo. And um, what's really great about this particular solution is it supports the installation of extensions and the exportation from the Business Central environment to both Microsoft Fabric and Azure Data Lake Storage. So you can use, you know, kind of now, to kind of give you a sense of what, what this is, if you're familiar with the Business Central user interface, well, this is just simply an embedded element within the user interface. 
that's one of the greatest things in our mind, you know, about that is that you are literally interacting with how you want to replicate the data from the ERP, in this case, Business Central, to uh, One Lake or to Azure Data Lake Storage, um, you know, by making some selections. And so the selections, you know, kind of they they naturally kind of take the firm, form of what kind of storage you're going to do. Um, you do get the opportunity to choose which tables that you want to include. Um, you can go through, and we'll talk further about scheduling and, and those sorts of things. But it's a if you have not looked at this and you do have Business Central, I would highly recommend that you you consider uh, using it. And what's really great about it, as I mentioned, you know, the tables are selected uh, in the D365 user interface, you know, for the exportation of one like uh, the schedule via the native job scheduler within Business Central um, can run on all tables or, you know, in individual tables. And while the default format is CSV that's being exported, you know, over into data lake storage, there's a nice companion Spark notebook that converts uh, all those formats to Parquet. Um, and, you know, I won't, I won't read, you know, Bert's quote, but, you know, I would highly recommend that if you're interested in understanding this more deeply, um, do seek Bert out, you know, via Google, you know, to, to kind of see, you know, more of his examples that are in the real world. Uh, the simplest picture that I could kind of really present is you naturally have Business Central is an application, which is the big box on the left-hand side. You then have as effectively the underlying database of Business Central um, available. What happens is the incremental updates are, are read and stored by the Azure Data Lake um, export extension. And what that happens is at the scheduled intervals, those updates are pushed out in this case to Fabric and One Lake could be Azure Data Lake Storage, um, and once it's there and available, you know then it can be processed by the the Spark notebook into the Lakehouse tables with you know the underlying Parquet format, um, and then available you know to Power BI. And of course, there's some other architectural pieces in terms of medallion architecture and things like that. But again, this is this is such an exceptionally better way of doing it. Than, than than relying solely on Power BI connecting directly to BC or you know building a multitude of pipelines that all connect to and pull from BC. Uh, I, I honestly think that those latter scenarios are just uh, encouraging a lot of technical debt, whereas this this piece is something that can be very much managed you know from within the application. So. Um, so kind of moving on uh, to, you know, staying within the ERP realm, but, you know, talking a little bit about, you know, kind of the experience in finance and operations. So finance and operations as a successor to Dynamics AX uh, is generally found a lot more in the kind of the upper portion of the mid-market, the enterprise type customers. Um, there are, you know, naturally a lot of things that, that people do. Apparently the Power BI flop gets really bold with the uh, D365 finance and operations. Sorry for that. Uh, but, you know, as we've kind of charted out here, you can use Dataflow Gen 2. You can use Data Factory pipelines and Spark Netbooks all within Fabric. But there is no native connector. So you are effectively going through uh, OData type interfaces. Um, and, you know, the Dataflow Gen 1, you know, I mean, honestly, I don't know that, that people would consider that, you know, much uh, as much of a solution, you know, going forward. Um, so what does that what does that ultimately mean? Well, if you are familiar with D365 FNO and you've been you know kind of on a data journey with that product for a good while, um, you'll know that there are quite a few choices that Microsoft has made available uh, over time. A lot of it depends on you know what you know people are looking to achieve. So if uh, if there's a need for reporting to happen kind of naturally within the application, you know, that, that's, you know, kind of one of the considerations. The other considerations around, you know, what is acceptable from a latency standpoint, you know, around the data. Um, and, and then lastly, you know, in terms of kind of the quick bullets on this slide, you know, if there, if FNO data is all you're looking to report on, that's one scenario. If you're looking to use FNO data with other data, then you really need to kind of make some different choices. And what are those choices? Well, those choices, Again, uh, some of us can see. Yeah, now okay. it is audible. Yeah. 
Okay, I, I'm sorry. I'm not not quite sure. I think my internet's you know tired is <laughs> or something. I'm not sure. So we'll we'll, we'll yeah. keep going. But please please do let me know. So sure, sure. Okay, if, please. If if uh, for those that maybe didn't quite fully get it, so the um, the options you know that we'll talk about here: are Entity Store BYOD, which stands for Bring Your Own Database, uh, and the other is the Export to Data Lake. So. Um, Let's talk a little bit about the Entity Store. So the Entity Store is the in-application data store for D365 finance and operations. Um, if you came from the Dynamics AX world, you remember Dynamics AX created uh, natively some OLAP cubes. Effectively, this is pretty similar. Um, it's just a direct query type opportunity uh, for Power BI that is effectively embedded uh, within the application. It, the entities are optimized for reporting. Um, it uses Power BI in an embedded capacity. Um, and, and so it's not available in you know, the external work spaces that you may manage. It wouldn't be available in your fabric workspace, for example. As a matter of fact, it is really challenging kind of to deploy, uh, to build and deploy Power BI reports, you know, into this environment. Um, you have to use lifecycle services, you know, to kind of make that happen. Uh, there's obviously some advantages in terms of, you know, the ability to quickly report on data as it sits within the application. That's a really strong kind of capability. It has tremendous challenges in terms of interacting with other data um, because, the only way that you can really introduce other data for this purpose um, would be to, uh, well, basically import data into D365 FNO. And I don't think that you know any organization is really looking to kind of bloat or create custom entities within FNO solely for the purposes of importation. So it's one that I would not necessarily rank pretty very high on the list, but it is one that many organizations have used and possibly will continue to use if there's some real time requirements around some of their reporting. The next is the bring your own database. And so BYOD or bring your own database is a solution that's been offered uh, for a good while um, since the the inception of D365 FNO. Um, and it is one of the items that has not been targeted for deprecation or nobody's really talking about it being deprecated. Now, in order to use BYOD, you got to have a little bit of dexterity because you've got to create your own Azure SQL infrastructure. Um, you've got to configure the, the export of the entities. Um, and you can see the kind of the numbered elements on the side, one, two, three, and N. Um, you literally have to do that on nearly every entity that you want to export. And so it, it's challenging. And then on top of the challenges, you do have to also relabel typically um, columns for um, Power BI slash end user friendliness. I mean, it's going to basically be replicating, you know, kind of what you get, you know, within the, the native schema. Um, you know, it's it's challenging, um, you know, to say the least. And so, you know, again, that's one we'll touch on, we've touched on, but we won't dwell on. So um, the next one, and, uh, you know, there, there's a little bit of kind of a secret behind this, but uh, export to data lake was made available by Microsoft shortly after they realized that BYOD was not the answer for everybody. Plus, Azure Data Lake Storage just became much more popular. Um, you'll notice in the big red font that this particular approach is expiring on uh, November 1st, uh, 2024. Um, it basically, it, it was a, an extension that would replicate to the Data Lake not dissimilar to what uh, Business Central uh, experiences today, uh, but it was a little bit more kind of engineered directly into the product versus being a GitHub type of a repo. And so if I change the screens just slightly, um, you know, we still have, you know, a couple of options. You know, we have the combination of export to data lake, which again is going away, or we can use the Synapse link. And so the Synapse link is really proving to be the preferred way of making sure that uh, entities are very seamlessly replicated from FNO in the Dataverse uh, into, um, you know, the data lake environment. And that can be Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2, or it can be One Lake. Um, and then on top of that, you know, we have the Synapse Serverless uh, 
elements that basically kind of reconstitute the D365 tables uh, as external tables and views. Um, effectively, you know, it, through the views, it's more of a virtual data warehouse. And uh, as the diagram really kind of portrays, um, you know, it's an opportunity to kind of import the data into data sets or semantic models underneath Power BI. Um, and this is probably the cleanest kind of look at it uh, where we have, you know, Dataverse and FNO mutually feeding Synapse Link. Um, that then again is kind of coming out in a Delta Parquet format, you know, into the Azure Data Lake or One Lake environment. And again, you know, supporting, you know, kind of the scenarios that we, we talked about. Um, what's really great about all of this is, you know, it, it, it gives, gives the great opportunity you know, for you to ensure that data is kind of moving across from your ERP into this reporting context, uh, starting with, you know, kind of the the bronze layer of the uh, of the data lake. Uh, but it also ensures that uh, your organization is not necessarily having to invest in a lot of plumbing technical debt, you know, as, as I like to refer to it. So, um, but that's not, you know, the only, you know, kind of option that's out there. Particularly for those of you that are on Fabric, they're moving to Fabric now, but have been on Azure Data Lake storage or have been on the BYOD environment. Um, there are, you know, other opportunities. So when we talk about other opportunities for bringing data to one lake, we we would be remiss if we didn't talk about the fact that shortcuts do exist. So how do those shortcuts kind of touch factor into what we were just describing? Well, firstly, if you're already populating Azure data stores like Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2, you know, there is that, you know, shortcut facility, you know, for one lake, so you don't have to re, um, redeploy that data itself. Um, secondarily, there is also the support for shortcuts from Dataverse. So if, you're one, if your FNO data is, you know, firstly landing in Dataverse and, you know, you're using that as kind of your, um, kind of the, the operational data backbone underneath uh, elements of the application, well then Dataverse can support that that replication. So um, that, that is just, you know, kind of one of the options that's out there. Um, the other option, particularly for, um, you know, Azure SQL, and I'm not sure how much people are familiar with it, is there, there's also support for database mirroring and uh, database mirroring is something that is well worth looking at, you know, around Fabric. For those of you that are familiar with the fabric capacities, you know that it starts at F2, it goes all the way to F 2048. The number scheme is basically doubles F2, F4, F8, uh, so on and so forth. That number, you know, kind of means a few different things, uh, starting with capacity units. What it also means currently is it's support for mirroring up to that amount of terabytes of data. So, for example, at, a, at an F8, you know, you could mirror up to eight terabytes of data, uh, in this case, from Azure SQL environments or from uh, Snowflake or AWS or Google Cloud, you know, directly into uh into uh, the data lake, uh, sorry, the one lake storage environment as well. So, so what does this ultimately mean? Well, you know, if we look at you know kind of the, this you know kind of crazy hectic view of exportation of data, you know, to the data lake, um, the data lake, sorry, the data export service, which we didn't really get into you know, real deep around CRM or CE. Gosh, there's just a lot of parts, you know, that are that are moving there, and that's where you know I really call out that I think Dataverse is a great strategy if you've got multiples of the D365 applications like D365 FNO, like D365 CE, and the main reason is because you know the Synapse link, you know the Fabric link to Dataverse, you know, really just makes it that much simpler, you know, to not only kind of draw upon the data that's in these applications and land it, you know, kind of that bronze layer within the one lake environment, but it just accelerates kind of the journey uh, of, of getting, you know, kind of data from the dataverse, you know, into this environment as well. Now, if we were, you know, kind of all in the same room, you know, I might actually, you know, kind of ask if people, this all made sense to folks, um, you know, if people want to react or, you know, whatever and say that, you know, thumbs up, it makes sense, that's cool. Uh, but, you know, just know that this is just a much more simplistic way of going about 
creating kind of the right data architecture versus you know kind of this this uh, spaghetti like kind of picture that that we had previously um, solely with Azure. So that's part of the goodness of Fabric, obviously arriving and and supporting things uh, here as well. So, you know, the shortcuts to the Dataverse, you know, we, we mentioned, you know, kind of a couple of things there. Um, one of the things that I probably didn't didn't strongly reinforce is the shortcut is a no copy scenario, meaning you do not have to copy the data into the data lake environment to have access to that data to then do downstream sort of things. What does that mean? If you're familiar with the medallion architecture, bronze, silver, and gold, um, that means that the bronze layer can be kind of somewhat virtual. Um, and then the silver layer and gold, obviously you're reading and transforming and doing some things, you know, within the fabric tooling, you know, to, to get yourself to that kind of more subsequently refined states in both, you know, the silver and gold environment. What's really exceptionally cool about this, and it's really a, a little bit of a shame that, you know, you don't see the D365 Business Central, you know, icon up here. I'm hoping that that changes because I think that it's just would be one singular pattern for bringing data from the business applications that Microsoft provides, as well as Power Apps. So if you have Power Apps that are being, you know, built within your organization that are persisting data, the data that's in the common data model underneath them is obviously being stored, you know, within what is what used to be called the common data store is now the Dataverse, um, and so therefore, you know, that 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 ability to kind of uh, architecturally access the data, read it, do things with it, but have to copy all of it just becomes incredibly strong. So, so with that, we'll keep kind of moving along. And, uh, you know, one of the, one of the great things, you know, in my mind about Fabric, um, you know, having had the opportunity to do, gosh, every, every variation of, operational data store, data warehouses, lake houses, and, and ultimately kind of where we are in terms of kind of the most modern versions of the data state. You know, Fabric obviously gives us, you know, some more strong end-to-end -end capabilities. And it just so happened that I was working on these slides about the same time that we were going through the Olympic season. So it, it, it only made sense that, you know, we talk, you know, about the medallion architecture, although I, I did a great job of getting them out of order here. You know, obviously it's bronze, silver and gold, not silver, gold and bronze. So um, you'll have to forgive me for that. But when we are talking about the medallion architecture, if it's that's a new topic to you, just know that it's different ways of kind of taking on data in, in its most kind of raw form, and I'll probably advance the slide, sorry, um, to kind of preserve the original data to ensure that, you know, it's available for, you know, future processing analysis that needs to happen at kind of that lowest level, um, which is just incredibly important and incredibly, you know, kind of key, you know, in terms of the things that we do. Um, furthermore, it, it really, you know, gives you kind of that, that um, non-changed you know kind of version of the data that came into the system meaning well you know some of you may be familiar with the terminology garbage in garbage out well this is a clear opportunity to say hey the data that came in wasn't exactly the best data um without you know there there being any kind of assignment of blame or any of those sort of things but it, it just allows us to understand what's going on a lot more fully without the transform transformative things that tend to happen when we solely attach like a semantic model to a data source and, and we lose a little bit of that traceability. Um, what's great about the bronze layer is, you know, it supports, you know, kind of different ways that the data can arrive. So it can arrive in kind of a batch form, you know, that some of us are familiar with in terms of kind of traditional ETL and more sophisticated kind of streaming models for data arriving, um, you know, can be accommodated too. And, and what that means is that there's just a lot of flexibility that's available to us. Um, and, you know, there, there's, there's, you know, some great opportunities around the ability to kind of do some historical analysis, um, which I'll talk to in just a few minutes because there are really some cool features that are specific to um, specific to Microsoft Fabric and one like, you know, particularly in this regard. And the other piece is, um, you know, some of you are probably investing in or your organizations are investing in and exploring, you know, data science, machine learning, things of that nature. A lot of times the organization doesn't want you to do a whole lot 
it's kind of pre-prep, you know, with the data that originates from those applications, because the nuances of that data even feels a little bit uh, dirty or, or, you know, not of the highest quality actually kind of mean things, you know, for some of the data science, you know, experiments and workloads that people want to apply. So, but when we really talk about kind of where the rubber meets the road in terms of the architecture, um, it definitely has to be, you know, kind of the, the silver layer. And, and, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't at least, you know, kind of call out that I still fully think that, you know, the stuff that the Ralph Kimball and the Kimball group, you know, kind of pioneered around the dimensional model really set the foundation for the things that we do in both the silver and the gold layer uh, in terms of, you know, approaching things from a subject or a process area in terms of our orientation, avoiding scenarios where we're trying to boil the ocean when we try and, you know, kind of model our organization's data, which, by the way, is incredibly easy with D365 finance and operations. I mean, I think there's um, there's probably the better part of 2,000 entities that possibly could be discovered and brought into that layer. Now, realistically and practically, you know, you're probably in the, the low hundreds of, of tables that you'd want to interact with from the ERP, but that's still a lot. And it's still a lot because you have not only, you know, the financial elements, but in supporting finance, you have AP and AR, you have sales, you have purchasing, you have inventory management, you have a lot of other, you know, kind of project-based elements that are making their way in. So all of those different subject areas, you know, they kind of need to be properly modeled and the data refined in support of kind of those individual areas. In my mind, along the lines of conforming dimensions, which goes right back to kind of where, you know, the Kimball group started. And there's a lot of other things that, you know, kind of naturally, you know, could be discussed. If you've never had the opportunity to pick up one of the Kimball books or, you know, go to um, KimballGroup.com, I would encourage you to do still do that. It's obviously an older looking website, but some of the tips that are out there are still really domain around how we handle data, data and particularly model and design. And I, and I think there's a lot that, to be gained, but let's get back on track. And, you know, so the silver layer, you know, in terms of the things that we do deliver when we're in the silver layer, um, First and foremost, data cleansing. Um, we are now basically trying to mature the data from its most raw form into kind of a cleanse state. That might mean that we're removing duplicates. It might mean that we're correcting errors. It might mean that we're putting our own kind of organizationally accepted handlers for missing values. What does that mean? It means if, um, you know, there's a sales opportunity or a sales order that doesn't have a salesperson on it, rather than it just be simply left blank, we may assign it to like a, an unknown salesperson, you know, for the purposes of, you know, kind of further downstream analysis and ensuring that there's, you know, kind of a level of consistency there. Um, speaking of consistency, you know, what we're also doing is we're kind of standardizing to ensure that, you know, kind of all the things are kind of matching up as, as copacetically as they can in terms of kind of naming conventions and data types and, and things of that nature. You know, certainly this is the starting point for integration of multiple data sources into a unified view. Um, you know, and I always like to kind of cite the the customer as that, as that, you know, kind of entity that is really defined by multiple applications. You know, so if I'm talking about CRM as an application, well, customer has a certain definition and it probably looks a lot more like, um, you know, like an information card on, you know, what is the company about, you know, kind of what is their web address, you know, contact details, possibly for for individuals or primary contacts or those sorts of things. You know, it's, it's the start of the relationship with the customer. But there's some uh, additional additive elements that come into the customer definition, you know, such as the uh, such as the financial attributes and characteristics. So, you know, we, we may all think that we've got a wonderful customer because every time we go to them, they, they buy something from us. But if we don't have visibility to what's happening kind of on the finance side, we may not realize that, well, they, they take a long time to pay their bills or maybe they, they call our support line a whole lot or, you know, maybe they return 
products at, a, at an unreasonable frequency. You know, all of those would be flags that we would start to populate in the silver layer around the customer um, because it's just important and it's analytically meaningful and it, and it hopefully drives some outcomes for the business in terms of how they really look at the, the totality of the relationship with the customer when we're talking about integrated data. Um, Additionally, you know, within the silver layer, we can apply some validation so we can ensure that it's kind of staying at a certain level of quality and it's kind of um, meeting standards and, and you know, things of, things of that nature. Um, you know, so that is, that is also, um, you know, that, that's also, you know, kind of important part of it. Um, and, you know, the, the fabric, you know, in the fabric world, um, the silver layer, the silver workspace, if you will, you know, is kind of that intermediate storage, you know, for data that is ready for either further transformation analysis, but or also just simply, you know, straight into the kind of the reporting realm. Um, and we do have customers of ours that are effectively stopping at the silver layer as part of their, you know, kind of architecture and supporting some aspects of reporting because that information is is meaningful at that point as well. So. Um, Let's, let's see, there is a question out there. I'll try and just kind of tackle it real quick. With Fabric integrating most services, what do we know about the future of Synapse Analytics? Uh, good. That's a good going, great question. Uh, good questions I can answer right away. Great questions I probably need to think on for a second. So I'll uh, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that in just a moment. So, um, so you know, pictorially, um, you know, what is... What is it that we're doing in the silver layer? Well, we're you know creating the opportunity to um, have a platform to isolate you know kind of the application changes from the analytical model. And I'm sure you know a lot of you are sitting there going, "What in the world does that possibly mean?" Some of you, hopefully not too many of you, but some of you have possibly implemented the business applications from Microsoft, be it D365. Finance and Ops or Business Central or D365 CRM, only to have a scenario that they go, hey, guess what? We acquired another company and that other company has other ERPs and CRMs like HubSpot or Salesforce or you know, Sage as an ERP or NetSuite or even QuickBooks as an ERP-like application. Um, as a result, you know that that that's very. It's a very important to kind of have that isolation layer. And what I mean by that is, at the silver layer, that's where you are really defining what your organization's information model is. It isn't about replicating kind of the structures that um, that live within FNO or live within CRM. It's about saying this is how we look at sales in an organization or purchasing as an organization. And meaning, if these net new ERPs and CRMs show up on the right-hand side of the screen, well, you should be able to, without a, a, an, an extraneous amount of effort, feed those transactions into their own bronze tables and then support kind of effectively the unioning of that new data from those other systems with the data that's tried and true that define the original model. And you're not having to do kind of misshapen things like, boy, I want my Sage data to look like FNO data because you'll never get there. But, you know, to hopefully, you know, your organization's model is one that's much more simplified. Um, and, and so that's, that's you know, certainly kind of my bias and the basis for, for saying those things. Um, so what are the other things that we can do? Well, we can do some cool and transformative things. And so things just for you to be thinking about, you know, as you think about the way that data is handled from these dynamics applications, particularly in the silver layer, um, starts with time travel. And so if you're familiar with um, the, the, the the US based movie Back to the Future, you'll you'll recognize the uh, uh, the 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 car on the right hand side. Um, what is what does it mean? What does it mean to time travel with data? Well, what's really great is um, you know, and this this actually changed because the Microsoft Fabric folks, you know, kind of made this better. But effectively, it's an ability to query efficiently and quickly prior versions of the data without having to purposely store multiple versions of that data. And you know, why would you potentially need that? Um, well, if somebody says I always need to look at things as of 
Friday afternoon and, you know, and it's, you know, the midway through the next week, well, it's a great opportunity to do that or the need to, you know, kind of support a scenario where, gosh, you know, I need to reproduce this exactly as it yielded results from my machine learning, you know, processes, um, you know, a week ago. Um, it also supports scenarios where you possibly want to accumulate snapshots, and I'll talk about a little, that a little bit in a moment. But what kind of answers do you get, you know, and, and you know, how does this work? Well, the, the fabric implementation of uh, support for time travel is basically there is a replicated copy of the data, if you will, available for the last 30 days um, for those objects with no schema change. So if you have been storing data on customer and all of a sudden you added an attribute in the source application and your pipeline or whatever the process is brought that in that's going to wipe out the old um the old uh, versions of the information however if nothing changes with the schema then you've got a consistent 30 days that you can look at um, and how is that implemented well it, it's it's there's an example query that's here which i, I think everybody's going to have access to the slides i'm not sure how that works but um but what you'll notice is kind of below the order by there is the option for timestamp as of a particular date and so in this case you know we're effectively looking at the sum of sold quantities um you know for a given period uh, as of a particular date um that was in the past and what's really cool about that and you know this is this is the picture that maybe portrays it a little bit better is it supports you know kind of snapshot scenarios so um some of you have maybe done snapshots in the past this just makes it a lot easier because there are certain things that you potentially want to snapshot such as inventory levels why would you want to snapshot anything? Well, because there's still only 30 days of history there. So if you need to have kind of snapshots that are monthly snapshots, you know, this is the this is certainly the way to potentially support that. Um, it could be, you know, kind of how we've been producing the production levels. It could be accounts receivable, you know, balances from an ERP perspective to understand the health of how we're managing our accounts receivable function. Um, it could be sales pipelines. Now, many of us, you know, are probably not directly related to people that are kind of using CRM as salespeople. Um, and this isn't meant as an attack on salespeople, but salespeople can and have been known to, you know, the closer it gets to a deadline for an opportunity to have supposedly closed to all of a sudden kind of kick the can down the road 60 or 90 days so that they can kind of say, oh, the opportunity is still alive and kicking. Well, you know, there are tools, you know, somewhat natively to D365 that allow for a little bit of insight, but this really crystallizes that scenario where the sales pipeline is continuously being adjusted and an opportunity maybe has had, you know, five, six, 10 different estimated close dates over its life. Obviously, there's some sales management and activities that need to be happening with that particular person or the team that is selling to a particular account, and that that certainly affords that. Um, and then, of course, you know, on the the more transactional side of things with like sales or order volumes, you know, those are other things that can be snapshotted. And you'll see in the graphic, you know, effectively what we're doing is we're saying data lands on one lake. We use time travel as a means of kind of defining data that feeds into an additional entity. Once it's in that additional entity is basically its own kind of copy of that data um, that then feeds into the semantic model. The big caveat here is you can deal with larger volumes of data. So if I'm snapshotting um, 50,000, 100,000, 500,000 customers, you know, and their accounts receivable balances, you know, every month or more frequently, well, that's, you know, 500,000 new instances of the same records that are being added time and time and time. So you have to think about, you know, kind of how often you do your snapshotting. Um, organizations, you know, do it at different intervals. I'm very happy to kind of talk in greater detail about that with anybody that wants to chat, but uh, just know that that's, that's part of it. So in terms of, you know, kind of the gold medallion, you know, that is that is one that's kind of a question for a lot of folks. You know, it's like, where where do you, you know, most typically do it? And I was most recently uh, in Columbus, Ohio, and got to see um, an old friend, um, Steve Hughes, who is uh, is really a very much a thought leader around Microsoft Fabric. Um, he has a, a, a blog site, you know, uh, called Data on Wheels. Reason it's called Data on Wheels is Steve is uh, um, he's 
he's challenged with uh, uh, fighting ALS as a disease. And um, so his his videos, you know, if you get the opportunity to look at them, are really fantastic. They're architecturally incredibly sound. You know, he advocates for a multi multi works based uh, infrastructure that starts with the bronze layer of the lake house, the silver layer of the lake house. And he really advocates in a lot of scenarios uh, for the gold layer taking more of the form of a data warehouse. Um, and, you know, and I don't disagree with that because, you know, a lot of times at the point that we're in the data warehouse, that's where SQL becomes really the prominent language. Um, and, you know, it's just as it's it's not it's not that it's not supported in the lake house environment, but obviously it's a little bit more native uh, in the data warehouse environment. So um, those things being said, um, you know, I will will leave you with, you know, kind of this uh, again, this really strong architecture diagram. Um, I've covered a lot of ground. Uh, if there are questions, I'll figure out how to get to those. Um, you know, I would also advocate that if you want to uh, want to stay in touch, you know, that you reach out to me via my day job at Velocio.com, via my uh, other hours of the day uh, email address called No No Labs. Um, you can drop me a DM on LinkedIn or Twitter. I'm at Trey Johnson on both of those platforms. Um, I really have appreciated the chance to be part of the Fabric Global Online Conference to speak to so many of you today. Um, and if there's any questions, I'll uh, I'll see if I can kind of work through it. So let's see. Um, but feel free to plug some more in. So um, first. Uh, Hans, I did not really get to your question. I'll come back to that. Uh, Prashant, uh, may have missed it, but from a data ingestion standpoint, how would FNO be integrated with one leg? Do we need Dataverse and Power Apps to do so, or is there an alternate way? Um, so it, it all comes down to using and configuring Synapse Link from within the FNO application that effectively rides on the Dataverse backbone uh, for replicating data to one like Prashant. Um, are there other ways that you can, you know, kind of bring the data into um, the FNO environment? Uh, there most certainly are. Um, you know, as, as this particular slide, you know, kind of indicates, you know, you can use Gen 2 data flows, you can use data factory pipelines, what you're doing in both of those cases is you're creating, you know, kind of your own, your own kind of um, bespoke or custom way of doing so. And Kevin added on a comment. Thank you, Kevin. Wonderful um, fabric link for Dataverse that that they're using for CRM that works for FNO. That that's awesome feedback. So really good stuff. And that's that's one of the the cool things about you know the community aspects of this. Obviously, this is a this is a global you know, oriented event. But as you you know work in your local user groups, as you have a Data Saturday or a SQL Saturday near you. You know, you take the opportunity to kind of bring that knowledge forward because uh, it, it really it kind of takes all of us sometimes, you know, to understand, you know, kind of what the best patterns are and best practices. So thank you for that, Kevin and Prashant for the original question. So are there any other questions? Uh, Hans, I, I'm sorry, I'm just not quite uh, sure. Let's see, with Fabric integrating my services. You know, I mean, Synapse Analytics, I mean, you know, there, there, there's a healthy amount of architectural elements that are built on top of, you know, Synapse and serverless and those sort of things. I don't think that's going away um, or, you know, changing dramatically. If it does, there will obviously be, you know, a really strong opportunity and roadmap within Fabric. And that's the other thing that I guess I would mention is about Fabric versus um, kind of the prior experience with Azure. You know, with Azure, you know, there was, you know, kind of independent thoughts about how certain technologies upgrade and those sort of things. Fabric is, you know, effectively an end-to-end -end product. And so, you know, it, the the architectural changes that Microsoft may make, uh, naturally, they're having to think more broadly, you know, across the entirety of the Fabric product and the ecosystem that they affect. And that ecosystem, if, if the company I work for is any example, you know, we have customers that are on F2 in capacities all the way up into, you know, kind of exceeding kind of the equivalence of P1 and P2 on the Power BI um, premium capacity platform. So F64, 
F one twenty eight. You know, we 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 don't we don't necessarily you know get into the F two thousand forty eight, which is one hundred sixty thousand dollars USD per month. Uh, but but you know, there's certainly some larger consumers. You know, fabric end to end. So let's see. Excellent. Well, I think that Kevin and Prashant are for kind of chatting back and forth. Wonderful. Um, any other comments, any other questions? I know we're kind of right up against time. Um, I really appreciate the, the opportunity to spend kind of nearly the whole hour with the group. Um, and again, you know, if you uh, if you have a desire to kind of talk further about these things, you know, do stay in touch, you know, do reach out. Uh, I'd, I'd welcome the chance to do so. So with that, um, David, Rajendra, you know, I'll, I'll hand it back over to you guys. It's an excellent session, uh, Trey. Thank you so much. I like that uh, business central architecture. Wonderful. Yeah, no, no, good deal, good deal. Well, if anybody has questions, again, hit me up and uh, really hope you take full advantage of uh, the rest of this day of the conference and, of course, tomorrow as well. So.